because there was Lilith with her hands on her hips, wearing one of her fitted pantsuits and heels that made her look like some kind of vixen who'd rolled around in a billion bucks. Rena, the owner of Pepper's Pies, was at her side. Tell me you didn't have a one-nighter with Oliver Preston. Lilith went all power attorney lecturer on me. That's what I got for picking a BFF who was going to turn out to be a lawyer. I mean, I know you're infatuated with him, but seriously, Nikki, that isn't healthy. That man is liable to break your heart. I had to hold back the dubious laugh. Too late. He'd done that a long, long time ago. He'd been doing it all along. Guilt swept through me. I hated that I kept it from her. She was my closest friend. Still, the sad thing was, she'd taken Sydney's place. And Sydney hadn't known the full truth either, so how could I tell Lilith? Maybe it was stupid, but that felt like another betrayal. I forced a playful scowl onto my face. Oh, stop it. You know full well I didn't have a one-nighter with Ollie. He may star in a fantasy or two, but that's where it ends. I think I'm a little too hot for him to handle. More like he'd burn me to ashes. Lilith narrowed her eyes in suspicion, forever searching for the truth. But I'd played this one off for so long she wouldn't recognize the lie. Then why is he driving you to work? Rena gave me an I second that look as we turned and headed up the sidewalk toward Pepper's. I crossed my arms over my chest. I think the real question is, what are you doing here before five in the morning, Lily? Shouldn't you be back home snuggled up in bed with that hot husband of yours? Getting yourself more of those orgasms I was so kind to set up for you? Rena and I have work to do. Loosely translated, I knew Rena wouldn't give me such a hard time. At Pepper's front door, Rena turned the key in the lock and widened the door for us to enter. Pepper's fronted Fairview Street. It was another area that had undergone a massive rejuvenation over the last handful of years, including the luxury hotel Lilith's husband Broderick and his company had developed directly across the street. The entire area buzzed with possibility. Peppers served sweet pies and pot pies and breakfast pies. You know, basically heaven. Rinna had inherited the little diner from her grandmother and brought it back to life. Her grandmother's unique recipes were the staple that brought patrons in droves every single morning. Lilith gave a casual shrug. I thought I'd help set up this morning. I shot her a dry look. Dress like that? Another shrug. So maybe I woke up starving and wanted the first slice of pie this morning. Are you pregnant? Nothing like a little deflection. She gasped a horrified sound. Shut your mouth! You know Brody and I aren't ready for that. Yeah, yeah, you have empires to build. I waved my hand dramatically. Lily's husband, Broderick Wolf, was the CEO of Wolf Industries. His company had been responsible for a bunch of the revitalization projects that had been taking place in Gingham Lakes over the last several years. She scoffed. Hardly. We're just focusing on us for a while. And all those orgasms I earned you. I have to say my matchmaking skills are on point. She playfully rolled her eyes in his direction. She really thinks she set us up with Brody and Rex, doesn't she? Rinna smiled. The woman was one of the kindest people I'd ever met. You know there's no rationalizing with her madness. Let the poor girl have her delusions, she teased. Delusions? I gestured to myself with both hands. This is the stark, glorious reality. I'm responsible for all your happiness. I think you should give me all the presents as a thank you. Rinna's light laughter tinkled through the air, and my chest tightened in stark affection. I was so happy for her, for Rex, that he'd found the love of his life after everything he'd been through. Rex was one of Ollie's best friends, and I'd known him my whole life. Rex and Kale had become members of our pack somewhere in our childhood, with us nearly as much as Ollie, Sydney, and me had been together. Rinna had adopted Rex's little girl, Frankie Lee. Rex and Rinna had a little boy named Ryland, who was a year and a half old. I'd stepped into the role of honorary auntie faster than the doctor could say one more push. I adored those babies, my heart overflowing every time I got to be in their space. Of course, that rule applied to the newest member of our extended family, Evan. 
Sweetness didn't come close to describing that little thing. He'd been born completely deaf and had required a heart transplant as an infant. The thing about him? The child was pure joy, just like his mom, Hope. Honestly, sometimes when I saw Hope and Kale together, I was the deepest shade of jealous a person could be. I didn't mean to be, didn't want to be, but sometimes it was hard to watch all the things you wanted most, feel them burn inside of you, and have the deep-lying fear that they would never become a reality. Rinna flicked on the switches right inside the door. Bright lights burst to life in the darkened space. We all blinked, adjusting to it. The echo of pots and pans clanged from the very back of the kitchen where Kevin, the head cook, would have already been working for the last two hours preparing for the morning rush. Morning, Kevin, Rinna hollered, moving around the counter to start the coffee. Priorities and all. His voice was barely heard when he shouted back, Morning. Lilith slid onto one of the swiveling stools. So what were you doing with Ollie this morning? Lilith asked, point blank. Did I really think she'd let it go? I sucked in a breath, already knowing the riot my response was going to cause. But there was no hiding this. Someone broke into my apartment last night. Rena's hand flew to her mouth. Oh my god! Lilith flew to her feet. What? She demanded while Rena moved toward me, her hand reaching to grip my forearm, her eyes searching as she whispered, Are you okay? I knew that wasn't going to go over well, but I did my best to downplay it, to shake off just how truly shaken up I was. Shrugging a shoulder, I leaned against the counter and did my best to sound convincing. Seth was the one who responded to the call. He thinks it was just kids running around being punks the way they love to be. They're lucky I didn't catch them. A little ass-kicking would have ensued. Or maybe I would have grabbed them by the ear and dragged them back to their mamas the way my grandma used to do when I was getting unruly. Death by humiliation. I'm pretty sure that's all they need to teach them a lesson. I mean, seriously? Doesn't the world have enough douchebags? Here I'd been crossing my fingers it might skip this new generation. This isn't funny, Nikki. A shiver rocked Lilith's entire body as if she'd just been slammed with visions of every single horrible thing that could have happened. Kids aren't the same as they used to be. As if I hadn't noticed the downward spiral of decency. Distress rolled the length of her throat. They can be dangerous and mean, and they don't think twice about taking someone out if they think it will get them something they want or cover something up to keep them out of trouble. I deflated, because it wasn't a joke. Not at all. Deep down in my gut, I knew I'd been targeted, that it was personal, the way Ollie had said. Brenna and Kyle's faces flashed through my mind. They were worth it, and I'd learned a long time ago fighting for what was right wasn't always easy. I rubbed my palms over my arms. I know, and I promise I'm not being careless, which is why I went to Ollie's place. I could fight with the man about going back to his loft until I was blue in the face, but the truth of the matter was, I was thankful. Thankful that he'd somehow known I needed him. Rinna moved back to the counter. She pressed brew on the coffee machine before she turned around and propped her hip on the counter. So, you called Ollie and he came running? Something like that. Lily's brow arched. What do you mean, something like that? I sighed. It wasn't like I was surprised that she'd insist on pushing the issue. I searched for an explanation that wouldn't cause an uproar. He... He'd stopped by just as I was getting home after the meeting, so he was there when I discovered it. Surprise and speculation slashed a bunch of lines across her forehead. I could almost see the cogs turning in that analytical brain of hers. He just happened to stop by? An uncomfortable chuckle rumbled in my chest. He said he was worried, you know. Since you went and told him I'd bailed on you for drinks when you knew I just needed to study, I tossed out. The traitor. She probably thought she was doing me favors. The problem was, she didn't have the first clue she was throwing me to the wolves. Her brows lifted. Um, maybe I was worried too. Since when do you pass up an awesome bottle of wine on my balcony with your best friend? Since I decided to do something with my life. Hey, managing Peppers is doing something with your life.
Rinna pouted through a tease. A light chuckle rumbled out. Of course it is. Turning back to Lily, I cleared my throat. Correction, since I decided to do something different with my life. Lily pursed her lips. Uh-huh. Okay, so you're busy. I get it. That still doesn't explain Ollie showing up at your place. Are you sure there isn't anything you want to tell us? She pushed. I shook my head. There's nothing to tell. You have to admit, things have been super weird between the two of you for the last year. She pointed at me to stop me from speaking when my mouth started to flap with another flimsy excuse. Because things had been incredibly weird between Ollie and me over the last year. Worse than ever. I just hadn't thought she'd noticed. Yeah, he showed up, stayed while I dealt with the cops, and then kind of demanded I go home with him since my door was busted in. He said it wasn't safe for me to stay alone. Since when do you do anything someone tells you to do? Since an overbearing brute of a man decided he wanted to be my defender. Have you met Ollie? I figured that answer would suffice. A sleepover at Ollie's? Sounds to me like you're begging for trouble. Rena's observation blazed into the air. There isn't a whole lot that is simple when it comes to that man. My attention darted to her. A sea of unease lapped and churned in my belly. Ollie and I are old friends. Why'd it have to come out sounding like a confession of guilt? Rena blushed with whatever thought went racing through her mind, and Lily was looking at me as if she were chipping pieces of me away and labeling each one as evidence. That's all you have to say about it? After you've been gushing about that man for all of forever? Dish the goods, lady. God knows you always demand them of me. I had gushed. Telling Lilith I thought Ollie was hot and if I got the chance I would chew him up and spit him out. At the time, it had seemed like the best way to explain away the longing looks that lasted just a little too long. Play it off. Pretend. It was what I'd done to make it through. Believe me, if I had goods to dish, I'd be spilling because that would indeed be a fun story to tell. I lumbered through the lie. At least I got it out. The one where he picked me up and dumped me in his guest room where I slept alone and then brought me here this morning? Not so much. I left out all the million other things that made the situation complicated and so very messy. How I'd woken to hearing him having a nightmare and begging Sidney's name. How I'd wanted to go to him comfort him. He'd only made it worse when he'd stumbled out of his room, rumpled from sleep, looking so sexy I'd wanted to toss every single promise I'd made about him right out the window. Lilith pointed at me. Um, I call bullshit. I know that salacious mind of yours just went to dirty, dirty places. I demand a confession. I shrugged. The man's hot, and he was sleeping in the room next to me. Don't blame me for a fantasy or two. Worry pursed Rena's mouth. What do you do now? I'm not sure I like the idea of you going back to your apartment by yourself. Lily nodded. Me neither. The second you told me what side of town you were moving to, I knew it had trouble written all over it. Okay, Miss Moneybags, I shot at her. Her mouth dropped open in offense. Um, hello? You do remember I had to have Adeline take me in when I had no place to live. It's not like I haven't been penniless before. I'm going to have Rex start looking around for a house that his crew can fix up. It isn't right that you're living in that dump by yourself, Rena piped in. And here I thought Lilith was going to be the problem. Adamantly, my head shook. There is no way I'm letting you two buy a house for me. Rena carried on as if I hadn't said a thing. We've been talking about getting some investment properties. Really, it would be a favor to us. Not a chance, Rena. I'm no charity case. You know me better than that. She shook her head as she flipped on the heat lamps in the window. I do, and I know you slave away here at my little restaurant for meager pay. If anyone's getting charity, it's me. I think it's a great idea, Lilith agreed a little too eagerly. Maybe Brody can fund it, and together we can get another rejuvenation project going in Gingham Lakes. There are quite a few old neighborhoods that would benefit from one. It's good for everyone. 
the community, the economy, the investors. It's a win-win, really. Excitement bounced between the two of them. That would be amazing. Rex and Broderick back on a project together? Y'all are out of your minds, I said with a flippant wave of my hand, turning to start filling the little creamer pitchers. When I said give me all the presents, I was thinking along the lines of a gift certificate to a drop of hope, or maybe a nice Vicky's secret bra, you know, the push-up kind, since my boobs are basically non-existent. I didn't mean a house. Lily pursed her lips. Well, you can't go back to that hole, and it isn't like you can stay with Ollie forever. God knows I love him, but that man is a moody bear. He'll eat you alive. That was exactly what I was worried about. I didn't respond. Or has that been your plan all along? Tell me you didn't go into some dark alley and pay some sketchy-looking guy to bust in your door just so you could sleep in the same house as Ollie. You got me, I told her the words scratchy with dry sarcasm. Hey, when a woman gets desperate. She had no idea. I spun back around and leaned on the far counter, arms across my chest. I'm not desperate. He's the one insisting I go back over there tonight, that he doesn't want me staying alone. Lilith widened her eyes. Are you surprised? I guess I am. Shocked, floored, stupefied. I figured the last thing Ollie wanted was to be in close quarters with me. He cares about you, Rinna said as if it were as plain as the coming day lighting up on the bank of windows that faced the street. I shook my head. No. The only thing Ollie cares about is being a savior. Isn't that the same thing? No. Not when it was going to destroy me in the end. Chapter 10 Ollie. Seth, it's Ollie. He blew out a breath on the other end of the line. Hey, man. Was wondering if you were going to call. You think I wouldn't? I paced the concrete floors of my loft in front of the big bay of windows that overlooked my balcony and the city beyond. I had a view of the river twisting through the buildings as it cut through Gingham Lakes. My loft took up the entire third floor of the building. Olives existing in the bottom two floors besides for the small bit at the back that was my garage. The main room was open, decorated in dark woods and even darker leathers. The entire vibe echoed peace. Too bad I felt none of it. Seth chuckled a bit, but there wasn't a whole lot of amusement to it. Nah, I knew you would, especially with the way you looked like you were going to lose your mind last night. That was the problem. That was exactly what was happening. I was losing my mind. You want to tell me about this line of bullshit you were feeding Nikki about it being a bunch of kids breaking into her place? Because it sure didn't look that way to me. He sighed and I could almost see him rocking forward in his office chair at the station to lean his elbows on his desk. That's exactly what it could be, Ollie. We see cases like this all the time. But there was something about it that felt purposed. Like someone was trying to send a message. My hand curled tighter around my phone. And what kind of message would that be? The sound he made was strained, like he didn't know what to offer me. A warning? Anger tightened around me. Chains, constricting tighter. That doesn't mean that's what it was. It's only a hunch. Silence spun for a second before he continued. Has she made any enemies lately? Maybe broken up with somebody? My teeth gritted. Because I should know. Should know everything about her, hold her secrets, her dreams, her joy. I was the one who'd crushed every single one of them. And I sure as shit shouldn't be pissed by the idea of there even being someone for her to break up with. Not sure. But she's been interning with a psychologist, helping her run some meetings... She was texting someone last night from there on the ride back to my place. Gut tells me it has something to do with that. He exhaled heavily. Anything happening there is going to be confidential. You can't get in the middle of that. If it means Nikki's safety, I can. Ollie, he warned. I had you call me because I want you to know what's going on. To watch for anything out of the ordinary. Not for you to take off hunting like... He trailed off, leaving the rest suspended in the distance between us.
My mind filled in the blank. Like Sydney. I'd hounded that station for 14 years. They'd labeled it a cold case, and I'd labeled that bullshit. If they wouldn't hunt, I sure as hell would. I won't let anything happen to her, Seth. It was my own warning, a promise. Because whoever this fucker was... He was going to learn I had a message to send, too. I heard the bedroom door snap open. Hell, I probably didn't even hear it. More likely, I felt it, the presence stepping out from the far end of the apartment. That aura she wore was like an additional layer of her skin, glittering diamonds and glimmering golds reflecting off the sun. Swore I could feel that girl from a mile away. Bare feet padded on the concrete floor. That feeling grew stronger and stronger with each step. It had covered me whole by the time she made her way out into the main living area. What are you doing? She asked. That sweet voice hit me from ten feet behind. With the way chills went skating across my skin, she might as well have been whispering it in my ear. I stirred the ground beef I was browning in the skillet, giving her a quick glance over my shoulder, trying not to get wrapped up in her. Fresh out of the shower after I'd picked her up from work an hour ago and took her back to her apartment to pick up her car. Now the girl stood there, hair wet, skin damp, expression confused, spirit fierce. That was what always got me more than anything. The way she glowed this unassuming, timid belief, all wrapped up in a wide, bright smile. What's it look like I'm doing? Cooking? It was pure, horrified concern. I chuckled a little. Seems like we're on the same page, then. Curiosity drawing her forward, she rounded the tall table surrounded by stools that acted as a partition of the kitchen and living area. Or maybe it was just me, because I could feel the tether. Pulling. 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 The question is, why are you cooking? Aren't you supposed to be downstairs working? Probably. She popped her hip on the counter and crossed her arms over her chest. The stance pushed up her tiny tits, soft mounds of flesh swelling over the neckline of her tight tank, her olive skin warm and her innocent face soft, those freckles running across her nose. No chance could I keep my gaze from dipping from her mouth to that cleft. My cock stirred and my chest squeezed painfully. What the hell had I gotten myself into? Felt like I'd parachuted right behind enemy lines. Problem was, I had no idea if it was Nikki I was stealing in to rescue, or if it was this girl who was going to kill me in the end. So why are you up here then? Thought you might be hungry after a long day's work. Or maybe I felt like shit after being such an asshole this morning. It was a toss-up. Her brow rose and she tightened her hold across her chest. I'm a big girl, I think I can feed myself. If I'm staying here, I can't be interfering with your job. That bar means the world to you. So do you. The thought pierced me like an arrow, shearing straight through me. I hiked what I hoped looked like an indifferent shoulder, trying to fight off this bullshit feeling I couldn't shake. Couldn't stop the inundation in my mind, though. The idea of what might have happened had she gone back to her place earlier and gotten in the mix of whoever had been there. My insides clutched, in pain, in dread. Couldn't stop the assault of images, the horror of someone hurting her, stealing her away, too. I wouldn't let it happen. Not again. Not to her. And my call with Seth was not sitting well. Was hungry and didn't feel like eating bar food tonight. Thought you might be too, that's all. Don't always get down there first thing. Perks of being the boss. I shot her a wink with the last, and she was fighting the smile that was twitching across her lips. Must be nice she said, shifting away and opening the fridge. She dipped down to peer inside. My eyes landed on her ass, the girl wearing these tiny black shorts that barely covered her cheeks. Yeah, so, so nice. Unbearably nice. Sweat beaded on my brow, and I beat the attraction back, remembered my mission, why she was here. Want a beer? She asked, digging through my stash. Sure. She straightened, two beers in hand. She twisted the cap off the first one, handed it to me, and then opened her own before tilting it toward me. Truce? 
Unease wound through me as I stared at her standing in my kitchen. Never knew we were at war. She laughed a low sound, shaking her head as she glanced at her feet before she peeked up at me. Don't pretend we haven't been fighting something for a long, long time, Ollie. I scrubbed a palm over my face and down my beard, searching for an explanation, searching for a valid reason for shutting her out, the truth of why I broke her heart. Without revealing the part of myself I couldn't let her have. Not when it belonged to Sydney. Not when I couldn't be trusted. Think we both know you are better off without me? A little scoff bled from her mouth. I couldn't decide that for myself. You really think so? It was hard to meet her eyes, but I forced myself to, bringing attention to what I'd done for the first time. Like a dirty secret kept between us. Look what happened the last time I came to you. Pain lanced across her face. I felt it right at the center of me. Lash, lash, lash. Ones my selfishness had inflicted. But that was what it always was, wasn't it? Selfishness? Refused to be that way anymore. For a beat, she looked away, chewing on her bottom lip before she let out a small breath and asked, Did you need me? Or were you just using me? Hurt leached out in every word. Unable to stop myself, I closed the distance between us and took her face between my palms. My voice grit. I've always fucking needed you. She jarred, shocked by my sudden movement, and blinked up at me with those eyes that twisted me in two. I loosened my hold, and my words quieted. But just because I need you doesn't mean I get to keep you. For a minute, I just got lost there, looking at her, before I ripped myself away from her and turned all of my attention back to fixing dinner. Guessed I might as well add foolish to that list of fucked up qualities because that was maybe the dumbest thing I could have given her. But for once, she deserved it. A little bit of the truth. She wasn't looking at me as she fidgeted, those fingers moving out to fiddle with a dish towel sitting on the counter. I'm not sure how to move on from that night, she admitted. Sorrow had taken me whole when I looked over at her. Which one? That was the crux of things. We had no way to move on, both of us stuck, and I'd only made it worse leaving her when she was 16 and running back to her a year ago. Truce? I mumbled, reiterating what she'd said. Light laughter fell from under her breath. Feels like a shaky one. I gave a tight nod. No question it was. Shaky. But she'd been my friend long before she'd been anything else. So I searched for some kind of lightness, the easy yet profound way we'd once been. Probably. Just hold on to something when you move. One look at me and you won't be able to remain standing. It was all a tease with the tip of my lips. She choked out a laugh. Wow, someone really is full of himself. Just keeping things real. Amusement danced across her pretty face. So damned pretty. Painfully pretty. She was all smiles when she tipped the neck of her beer my direction. To poor girls who can't keep their heads on straight when they're in your presence, may they forever see through the BS. I clinked my beer against hers and then lifted it in the air. Believe me, baby, the outside looks way better than the inside. I let a little of the cold, hard truth sneak into my ribbing. She took a sip of her beer before she tucked it up close to her chest as she stared at me, her voice close to a whisper. I think you sell yourself short, Ollie. I've always been pretty fond of what's on the inside. I tossed a tortilla onto the griddle I'd had heating with oil. It sizzled and hissed, and I focused on evening it out with the spatula. That's an ugly place, Nikki. Believe me, you don't want to get anywhere close to that. Not anymore. What if I've just always wanted you for your body? Could feel her words take to the air, light and playful, the way we'd spent thirteen years acting like we didn't really know each other. Our interactions nothing more than a breezy tease when the wind that gusted beneath them threatened to be a dust storm. She was all taunting smirks when I looked over at her. Little tease. Probably the last thing I should do, but I went with it. Think I'm more than you can handle. 
A sexy twist of her lips had me stumbling. Well, if that's how you feel... She nodded and a flash of sadness twined through her demeanor before she tipped her beer my direction. Friends? I picked mine back up and clinked it to hers. Friends. The problem was, having to remain friends with Nikki Walters was the hardest thing I'd ever had to do. A half hour later, the girl's contagious laughter was bouncing against the walls. She popped the last bit of her taco into her mouth, wiped her hands with her napkin and rocked back on the high-backed stool. You're such a liar. That was totally your fault. My laughter was low, way too amused, barriers down that had been there for so many years. I shook my head as I sopped up a few pieces of meat that had fallen from my taco, glancing up at her with a grin when I did. My fault? Are you kidding me? Every bad idea I ever had was because of you, tying that rope to that tree included. I said it wasn't going to hold me, and what did you say? Guilt twitched all over her flirty mouth. I don't remember. A rumble of amusement rolled around in my chest. Think it went something like, Ollie thinks he's the shit, but he's really nothing but a chicken shit. On repeat, of course. No. Her head shook in vigorous denial, but she was doing her best not to bust up an outright confession. Indigo eyes full of old affection. The same kind gripped at my chest. Claws wanting to take hold. I shook it off and focused on being friends. Yes, you were always the instigator, whispering in my ear, making me think I wasn't a man if I didn't go through with whatever you'd concocted. I wiped my hands and tossed my napkin onto the table, slinging my arm over the stool back, grinning at her. Took it on myself to prove to you just what kind of man I was. Mischief moved across her face, honeyed locks of hair swishing across her cheeks, those freckles so fucking sweet. Had the intense urge to lean out and lick them. Taste her. That mouth and those lips and every inch of smooth, soft skin. Hey, it isn't my fault you thought you had to be such a badass. Sounds like a personal problem to me. More like I had my own personal troublemaker. And look who I was trying to keep up with. If anyone was the troublemaker, it was you. And look who I was trying to impress. A blush kissed across her chest, rising with the energy that danced, slowly, quietly, though just as intense. Her tone turned wistful. At least Kale discovered his true calling that day. He got really serious about setting your ankle. That shit hurt like hell, too, I told her through a chuckle. Memories hit me hard, one after one, like they were so close I could take a step and tumble into them. They called them the good old days. For us, they really were. She bit her lip. Nikki wasn't shy. She was just real. I really am sorry you broke your ankle. I didn't know what I was thinking, but I reached out and let my fingertips trail the defined curve of her cheek. She trembled, and for a moment, she leaned into my touch before she pulled away. Like she was just then realizing she needed to stay away from me. That I was dangerous. I shook the heaviness off and climbed back into the tees, pretending I wasn't treading choppy waters. Oh, sure you are. Who was it standing over me, laughing her ass off, holding her stomach, saying she wished she had a video camera so she could send it in to America's Funniest Home Videos? Thought you were going to get rich off me. She tried to hold back a giggle. Hey, I would have shared. Couldn't keep my eyes from tracing her face, every inch. I'd managed for so long, keeping her at a distance while still keeping her close. It's your fault. I trusted you. You were supposed to take care of her. You promised you'd take care of her. Voices resonated from the cold valley planed out inside me. I swallowed around the grief that thickened my throat, welcoming the reminder. I couldn't be trusted. God, I knew I needed to get the fuck out of there but there was something about being with her this way that made me want to stay, just for a little bit. A few moments of the relief she brought all heaped with a load of torment. I angled my head toward the television. You want to catch a show before I head downstairs? Are you sure you have time? Why not? Cece doesn't mind running things. You know she's just waiting to oust you from your position, right? She said as she slipped off the stool, her suggestion a bit of a tease, 
though I thought maybe there was a true question behind it. Nah, Cece might look like a viper, but she's harmless. Harmless? She let out a little laugh. She doesn't look harmless to me. She basically looks like she could annihilate the bar in one fell swoop. I plopped onto the couch. You jealous? Nikki dropped down on the opposite end with an incredulous shake of her head. Of the fact she's stunning and scary and basically can command the bar with a single look? Hell yes. Cece oozed sex and radiated intimidation. Men flocked to the bar, salivating and begging for a bone. Her attention the prize. The woman had the power to drop the poor suckers right to their knees. So maybe she wasn't entirely harmless. She just didn't pose any threat to me. I'll be sure to tell her that, I told her with a lift of my brow. Don't you dare. Women like that eat girls like me for dinner. I think you're safe. As far as I know, she likes men. Scowl. Tell me you don't know that because you've slept with her. She's your employee. That's just all kinds of wrong, Oliver Preston. She tried to make it come out as nonchalant, like she was giving a friend advice, but I heard the way the idea of it scraped from her throat, hurting her. Always, always hurting her. I looked at her, hooking up a small smile. Don't worry your pretty little head, Nikki Walters. I don't sleep with my employees. But you know Kale got a taste of that before he met Hope. Her eyes went wide with the scandal. No, she wheezed. Had no idea if I was breaking bro code by letting her in on that little bit, but somehow I couldn't make myself shut the hell up, needing this connection with her, hungry for it. Or maybe I was just trying to shift the attention from myself. Yup. Freaking Kale. He's lucky I love him so much. Nah, he was just doing his thing, biding his time until the right girl came into his life. She blinked these wide blinks at that, that feeling pulsing at my chest, thrumming in the space between us. So you really never slept with her? No, not even close. Her eyes narrowed for a beat like she was searching me for the truth, before she relaxed against the arm of the couch and pulled her legs up so she could hug her knees. Good. You're forgiven. For now. This time it was my brows riding high. And just what are you forgiving me for? Being a gorgeous, brainless, womanizing man. She said it with a jut of her chin, playful even though I could feel the undertone of severity the two of us broaching a subject we'd never trusted ourselves to touch before. An incredulous chuckle rolled out. Womanizing, huh? Now who's making assumptions about the other? Her amusement shifted and fell into something somber. Oh, come on, Ollie. You don't need to pretend for me. You think I don't see those girls? Regret clamped down on my chest. I grabbed the remote and aimed it at the television that sat on the console, voice a little lower than it needed to be. Those girls don't mean anything. Her voice was softer. Everyone means something, Ollie. Feels something. Whether you want to take it into account or not. This girl. I turned up the volume, like it might have the power to mute every mistake I'd ever made. She was right. Everyone mattered. Her the most and I'd gone and treated her the same goddamned way I treated everyone else. Needing a diversion, I flipped through some channels. A grin took over when I found what I was looking for. Could feel her amusement ripple from her spirit, the way her mouth twisted up as she attempted to keep herself from laughing. She stretched out her leg and gave me a little kick to the thigh. AFV, are you kidding me? My eyes glided up her bare leg. For a beat, my attention locked on the frayed, braided bracelet made of red thread she still wore around her ankle, the worn metal charm in the middle stamped with the words, Fly. I had one to match hidden in my room, unable to bear wearing it, seeing it. The third piece was missing forever. My guts ached. I shoved off the thoughts and let feigned innocence lift both my shoulders to my ears. What? I thought it was your favorite show. Stupid boys. She muttered for what had to have been for the millionth time since I'd known her. The thing about it? It was the first time she'd said it in 14 years. 
I pretended I didn't feel contentment go sinking all the way to my bones. She shifted and groaned a little as she tried to get comfortable on my couch. Totally should have ignored that sound, considering it spoke directly to my dick, but the question was sliding free before I could stop it. What's wrong? Legs just get tired from running around the diner for nine hours a day. Feels good to lie down. This couch is heaven. Seriously, Ollie, when I leave, I'm taking it with me. No need to report a robbery. You know where it'll be. I let loose a fake gasp. After all my kindness, you'd go and steal from me? She peeked over at me with a sweet grin that slid right through me. For this couch? Absolutely. Here. Reaching out, I dragged both her feet onto my lap and angled to the side a bit so I was facing her better. Such a bad, bad idea. She was right. Stupid boys. So damned stupid when I took one of her feet into my hands and kneaded my fingers into her heel. Nikki's gasp was real. Hitting the air like a motherfucking drug. Just a moan from her tongue, a spell. For a moment she hesitated. Clearly the girl knew this was a bad idea too. Because she stilled before she relented. The anxiety firing through her body went lax and she rolled onto her back to grant me better access. She emitted another one of those groans throatier this time. Don't make me steal this couch and you too. A girl could get used to this, she murmured. I had to suck for air because my lungs squeezed, constricted with a rush of lust. Like a dumbass, I continued to massage her foot, my thumbs pressing deeper into her heel before I moved to the arch. Wishing I was closer, needing more, a sigh pulled from between those pink lips and the air shifted, sizzled and lit. That had always been the problem with Nikki. She was heat and light, a spark in a flame. Sunshine. I thought I just might lose my mind because I swore I could see that aura she wore gather between us. Colors. Reds and purples and blues. They thrummed and lapped. It made it impossible to breathe. I moved to the ball of her foot and then to her toes, which were tiny and somehow delicate the nails short and painted the same shimmery pink color of her lips. Did it make me a sick fucker that I wanted to suck one into my mouth? That I wanted to lick up her bare leg? Nibble at the inside of her thigh? She squirmed, and my breaths came harder, harsher, while hers turned shallow. She arched from the couch. Need and pleasure. I wondered if a girl could go off from a foot massage alone, because I thought maybe I could from giving one. My cock strained painfully as I moved to her other foot. Ollie, she whimpered, that feels so good. Visions slammed me. Clearly, the girl bear laid out under me, an offering. Nikki, Nikki, Nikki. I dropped her foot like a rock and launched to my feet. Erratically, my chest heaved as lust careened through my body. I roughed both my hands through my hair, trying to calm the fuck down. Get myself together. You can't be trusted. You can't be trusted. Shocked out of the trance, Nikki shot up to sitting. Her eyes blazed as she stared across at me. With desire and regret. With the realization she should be protecting herself from me. She clutched the couch like it was a life raft she was getting ready to get tossed from. This was stupid. So stupid. Need to get downstairs, I told her, voice rough. She nodded. For the first time since I'd known this girl, no smart reply came from her mouth. I didn't wait for her to form one. I flew for the door. My own life raft. Because I was right. This girl was a wave getting ready to take me under. And I didn't think she'd ever let me up for air. Chapter 11 Nikki It was close to 5 p.m. when I bounded down the three flights of stairs and out the big metal door into the back parking lot. Humidity smacked me in the face, and I was hit with the overpowering scent of honeysuckle that wafted through the dense air. I jogged across the lot to where I'd parked my car after Ollie had taken me back to my apartment to pick it up yesterday afternoon. I knew I shouldn't find comfort in staying with him, but I wouldn't lie to myself. I did. I wouldn't have been able to sleep last night had I been staying at my apartment, fearful Caleb might return. All I wanted was to lie low, hide out, 
just for a little while. Until things between him and Brenna cooled down. Of course, I had to admit I hadn't slept all that well, knowing Ollie was once again just a room away. A wall and a million miles separating us. But after the evening we'd spent together, it had felt as if part of that chasm was being erased. Drawn. That magnet that would live forever pulling us together. It was a bad idea to get close to him. I knew it. Of course I knew it. But sometimes life made it hard to pretend he hadn't once been the most important person in my life. Anxious to head to my sister's house, I clicked the fob and started to pull open the driver's side door. Then I froze. My stomach plummeted to the ground. The hairs at the nape of my neck lifted on end, and the sweat that was already threatening to gather beaded across my forehead and neck, trickling down my back in a slow slide of dread. Another note. It was folded neatly and tucked beneath the wiper. He'd found me. Oh God, he'd found me. I gulped around the rush of terror that glided through my body. Followed me, more likely. From Brenna's description, he was manipulative in the worst of ways, yanking her one direction then the other until she thought she was going insane. Warily, my attention darted around the area, searching beneath the towering trees that lifted to the blue, blue sky, across the line of cars that were parked next to mine since this area was reserved parking for Olive's employees. Nothing. Just the whisper of the leaves and the sound of the busy street echoing from the other side of the building. Shit, I mumbled. All I wanted was to run right back upstairs. Maybe curl up in the bed Ollie had told me to consider mine. Maybe curl up in his. Damn it. I could not let my brain go down that train of thought. But it seemed almost impossible. Not with the way he'd always made me feel safe. Not with the way he'd touched me last night. I wanted to fall into Ollie's strong arms and beg him to take it away. But I wasn't that girl. One to be frightened away. Threatened until I backed down so some jerk could have his way. Brenna deserved so much better than that. Taking one last glance around the lot, I snagged the note and hopped into my car, quick to slam the door and press the lock. Heart a riot in my chest, I carefully unfolded it. Fear slicked across the surface of my flesh, a cold, cold dread. You think you can get away so easily. He can't keep you from what's coming. Thunder. It rumbled through my being, a warning. A siren that screamed, pulse a deafening pound, pound, pound as it echoed in my ears. I squeezed my eyes closed against the shackle of terror that gripped me. I'd always known working for the program would require sacrifice, that it might not always be easy. Maybe I'd known I was getting in too deep. I'd just never expected it might make me feel like I was going to drown. I hoisted myself onto my little sister's kitchen counter. Sammy gave me a scowl. Were you born in a barn? Playfully, I rolled my eyes at her and tossed another grape into my mouth. Um, if I was born in a barn, then I'm pretty sure you were too. Next thing you know, you'll be making your mama jokes, trying to cut me down to size when you're really just cutting yourself off at the knees. She swatted at me. Psh, if I wanted to cut you down to size, I wouldn't need to look to our mother. Think I've got plenty to work with just with you sitting there. We could start with that face. Ouch, I said, grinning wide. Funny how neither of us were feeling the love unless we were razzing the other. Old habits die hard and all that. Before you start going down that road, you should probably take a gander in the mirror, I told her. She laughed. Oh, God. Now don't you go talking about how much we look alike. A couple days ago, I was at that little market over by Grandma's. Remember her neighbor, Margo? I was loading my groceries onto the conveyor belt when I heard someone shouting, Nikki, Nikki, is that you? I don't know why she even bothered asking the question when she refused to believe I was your sister and not actually you. You say this as if looking like me is a bad thing. She laughed as she flitted around her cozy country kitchen, preparing dinner, the smell of a roast simmering on the stove making my stomach growl. Her face really was so much like mine that it felt as if I was looking in a mirror. A few years younger and a tiny bit rounder from the few pounds she was still clinging to after giving birth to my sweet niece two months ago. 
Did you show up at my door digging for compliments? Um, no, I didn't show up at your door digging for compliments. I showed up at your door digging for dinner. That, and I needed a distraction. I had to tell Seth about the notes I'd found on my car. I knew I did. But I needed to work myself up to it, figure out exactly what information I could give without betraying confidence, knowing I didn't have proof. But my gut? It was sure. On top of that, I'd needed to get out of Ollie's loft, clear my head, decide exactly what I was going to say to him. I couldn't just stay there and keep him in the dark about what was happening, but God knew I was terrified of letting him in on this. He wasn't exactly rational when it came to a threat. Plus, I had to be careful before I lost my heart all over again. No doubt that was the most dangerous position I could get myself into. Sammy pulled out a cutting board and set a head of broccoli on it. Well, I guess you came to the right place then, didn't you? Just expecting your married sister was going to be slaving away in the kitchen for her husband. Isn't that what you're doing? I teased, eyeing the spread she was preparing. Chuckling, she shook her head. I do it because I want to do it, not because I'm obligated. I nudged her with my shoe. You think I don't know that? And there is not a thing wrong with you wanting to take care of your family. She glanced over at me. Something about her expression was wistful and sad. I never really thought it was what I'd want to do. I always envisioned myself in a big skyscraper in an even bigger city, working my way up the corporate ladder. And now all I want to do is spend the day rocking that baby. You always dreamed of getting away from Gingham Lakes, didn't you? Her head shook a bit. Sometimes you think it's the place you need to escape, when really it's just your situation. I stilled at that, something unsettling about her statement. I searched her face. What does that mean? Her posture stiffened, and she pinned on a smile. Nothing. Just means I thought there might be better things out there waiting for me in the world. Why's that? She inhaled deeply, biting her bottom lip as she continued chopping. It's nothing. Just never quite felt comfortable in my own skin. I shifted to the side so I could see her better. I don't get that, Sammy. You were always the happiest of us all. She puffed a little sound. Not even. You and Sydney and those boys. You were always running free, leaving your poor baby sister behind. A chuckle rippled out, and I reached over and grabbed another handful of grapes from the bowl. Ha! <laughs> Every time I tried to take you anywhere, you didn't want to walk. How many times did Ollie have to carry you home on his back? She laughed low and tossed the florets of broccoli she'd just cut into the pot of water boiling on the stove. Good thing that boy was always the size of a bear, always having to carry all the poor, pathetic girls around. She grinned. Of course, you were probably just faking being tired so you could get yourself one of those rides. Anything to get your arms around that man. Nostalgia moved through me, joy chased by sorrow. I couldn't stop the sad smile. She sobered a bit. You know, I always thought the two of you would end up together. My head shook. No, we have too much in common, too much history to ever make that work. Isn't that what makes a good relationship? Not when all that history is filled with pain. She nodded slowly, quick to change the subject. So, how are your classes? Good. I'm so close to being finished. I can't believe it. I'm really proud of you, you know? Light laughter escaped. It's about time, isn't it? Here I am, 30, and barely figuring out what I want to do with my life. Funny how things were supposed to be coming together, and every piece of me felt as if it were descending into disorder. The apartment, Brenna, the internship, and somehow staying with Ollie felt just as big as all of that. Maybe bigger. This was Ollie we were talking about. My great big world. He'd taken that world from me for so long, and now I felt as if I was stumbling through it in the darkness. I chose not to tell my sister any of those things. She didn't need to be fretting over me when she had her family to care for. To worry for. The important things in life. She glanced over at me as she started to make gravy in a skillet. I wasn't joking when I said I'd come around here digging up dinner. 
My baby sister knew how to cook. Mama is so happy you're getting ready to graduate. My chest tightened with a smidge of pride. She's always worrying about me. I think she keeps forgetting I'm 30. Sammy laughed under her breath. That's because Mama thinks she's still 30. Standing at the stove, she looked back at me, concern in her eyes. I'm worried about how she's handling Grandma falling ill, moving in with her to be her full-time caretaker. That's got to be hard, seeing her own Mama like that. So many emotions raced through me at the thought. I didn't know how to make sense of them. My Grandma, who'd always been so alive and strong... The summers we'd spent running in and out of her house, the screen door slamming shut as we came and went. It has to be the hardest thing any of us ever go through, watching our mothers fall ill. God, I can't stand seeing it with Grandma. Every time I go over there, it breaks my heart a little more. She nodded through the somberness of it. That cycle of life we'd give anything to stop, but never could. It didn't matter how old my Grandma was, my Mama, my sister... There'd never be a time when I didn't want to cling to them forever. At least Uncle Todd is back in town to help around the house. That will hopefully take away some of the stress, I said. From behind, Sammy's spine stiffened, and I could have sworn I saw her knees sway, losing balance. Sammy? You okay? She nodded. Of course. Just hate the thought of Grandma being sick. Just then... The speaker on the baby monitor crackled. A tiny, rattling cry came through, and I slid off the counter. Let me get her. That'd be nice, Sammy said with a gracious smile, though I couldn't shake the feeling something was suddenly off. I headed down the hall and eased open the door to Penelope's room, which was adorable with its hearts and elephants everywhere. My chest filled. So full. Almost too full. The feeling only came stronger as I looked down at my niece, who was flailing one fist while trying to shove the other into her tiny mouth. Somehow she had kicked free of the blanket and was wiggling around, making the sweetest sounds. I couldn't help but echo them back. Hey, Angel, I whispered, scooping her into my arms. How's my sweet, sweet girl? Auntie Nick has been missing you. I hugged her to my chest and kissed the top of her head, whispering against her crown. So much. She cooed, scratched her sharp little nails in my chin as she fisted at my skin. Was it wrong the little thing made me ache? It wasn't like I was old, but I still felt that time slipping away. A piece of me missing that I'd always assumed would just be there one day. I could swill wine with my friends and laugh all my nights away, give back the best I could, live and embrace who I was, I'd be happy. That didn't mean something wouldn't be missing. Maybe it only seemed fitting it was tucked right down in that place with all those pieces that had gone missing long ago. Nick? I startled with my sister's voice coming from behind me. I spun around to find her standing in the doorway. There was something mournful in her expression, as if she'd just heard every single one of my thoughts as if I'd said them aloud. Or maybe I just saw it projected back, her face like a picture of mine. I pasted on a thin smile. She's so beautiful, Sammy. If I were you, I'd want to sit and rock her all day, too. Sammy gazed at her daughter. It's funny. Just looking at her makes me believe the world could be a better place. Hugging the tiny thing to me, I kissed her temple. And I believed it, too. Outside of my sister's house, I sat in the driver's side seat of my car, in the darkness, holding the card Seth had given me between my fingers. With a shaky hand, I dialed the number. Two rings later, a scratchy voice came on the line. Hello? Seth, it's Nikki. Are you okay? He rushed. I sucked in a breath, eyes darting through the windows, searching the shadows. The feeling of being watched sent chills crawling across my skin. No question I was being paranoid, but I couldn't seem to stop the dread clinging to me. I just couldn't take the risk. Yeah, I'm fine. I just... I have something I need to tell you, but I need to promise you won't tell Ollie. Chapter 12 Ollie
I snapped open the door to my turquoise blue 1950 Chevy truck to the sticky summer air. Birds flitted across the sky that was painted a bright, brilliant blue, and the lush, towering trees rustled in the gentle breeze blowing through. I stepped out onto the sidewalk and shut the door to the old truck, which was basically my prized possession. When I found it, it had been rotting at the back of this old guy's land, swallowed by weeds and pretty much rusted down to the metal bones. It was kind of my thing, taking the dilapidated, the neglected, and the failing, and doing my own sort of restoration. It was where I found my joy, taking something that had been left for ruin and giving it a new life, a second chance when I wasn't ever going to get one for myself, a certain sort of retribution, like I was desperate to find something good buried in the rubble. My first love was my bar, taking it from the ruin it had been and breathing a new life into it. I took just as much pride in the cars I had restored at a local shop, Roke's Restorations, a garage I'd invested some money into when it had been threatened with going under. Hell, I'd invested in a few failing businesses around Gingham Lakes, wanting to see something good rise out of the dust. But the cars? I loved watching them going from completely rotted to immaculate, from a heap of junk to a priceless treasure. Guessed it was a whole lot easier to fall for material things than things made up of flesh and blood and spirit. Safer. But sometimes not falling proved itself impossible. Which was precisely the reason I was there today, driving this specific truck when I had five others to choose from in my garage. Because... Evan. The first time Kale had brought him to my place... The little boy had run through that garage like he'd gotten a lifetime pass to Disneyland and couldn't wait to visit it every day. His big old bug eyes had been nothing but excitement behind his thick-rimmed glasses as he'd gone from car to car. His fingertips had traced the metal, and he'd sat behind the steering wheel of each car, pretending like he was flying down a racetrack. Kale hadn't even protested when I'd let Evan climb onto one of my motorcycles. But this truck? It was his favorite. He'd claimed it as his on that big spiral-bound notebook he always carried around, jumping up and down as he'd shoved it toward my face to tell me just how much he loved it. Then he'd gone and left that ripped-out piece of paper on my coffee table so I wouldn't forget. A light chuckle rippled out as I thought back to that day, to the way the kid had gotten right under my skin like he'd belonged there all along. The same way Frankie Lee and Ryland had done. So there I was, locking the door of that truck and reaching into the bed to snag the football I'd tossed back there for my little adventure to the park that sat smack dab in the middle of our small city. Meeting up for a motherfucking play date. Talk about being a third wheel. Out of place. A damned fish out of water when this was the very pond I grew up in. Kale, Rex, and I had spent many an afternoon running the fields as kids, kicking up dirt, causing trouble the way we'd always liked to do. A couple of hours ago, I'd gotten a text from Rex to meet them there. I hadn't even hesitated. I needed to get the hell out of my loft. Nikki's scent had been stalking me like a fucking drug since the second I'd woken up. I could feel the fractures and splinters getting deeper and deeper, cracking me open wide. My thoughts dangerous, my need dark. The last four days, we'd basically avoided each other, me grunting hellos and her offering timid, unsure smiles as she hightailed it out the door as quickly as she could, spending as little time within the walls of my apartment as possible. She'd be gone before I even woke in the morning and already fast asleep by the time I made it back upstairs after closing the bar. You'd think with the little amount I actually saw her, it wouldn't be all that bad. Not true. I was constantly on edge. Need gliding across my flesh like the sharp edge of a knife. Lust and regret a bottomless pit in the well of my stomach. Worry this constant thud that banged inside of me. Seth still had no word on who might have broken into her apartment, and until he did, I wasn't about to let her leave. Guessed a little fresh air would do me some good. I rounded the front of the truck and headed for the park. Fields and playgrounds went on for what had to be a mile, all closed in by massive ancient trees. The second she saw me, Frankie Lee came running in my direction. Long brown hair flew behind her like a cape, wild and uncontained. Grinning, I moved a little faster to meet her. Like I said, 
Sometimes it was impossible not to fall. I dropped the football just in time to use her momentum to grab her under the arms and spin her around and around. She howled with laughter, shouting, Come on, Uncle, can't you go any higher? She was a wild one, that was for sure. So damned happy and full of life, there was no way you could be around her and not smile. She reminded me a little of Nikki in that way. The way Nikki had been at her age, so eager to experience life. Though Nikki had done it with a tiny bit more fear. Doses of hesitation coming on. Careful. It had always been Sydney who'd spur her on, telling her to run, jump, that she could do it. I wondered when Nikki had decided to get so reckless. Brave. Which fucking sucked, because the last thing I wanted was for her to be brave, constantly having to worry about the position she might be putting herself in. Stepping up when she thought it might right or wrong. Make someone's life better. Even if it was just a conversation with a lonely old guy living on the street. I beat back the direction my thoughts were going and instead focused on Frankie, who I was still spinning. Her squeals of joy hit the air, and it didn't take too long before I decided she had to have had enough and slowed to set her on her feet. Wasn't surprised in the least when she went stumbling back toward the rest of the group, veering to the right, totally dizzy and off kilter. Had to admit I felt a bit of that spin too. She starts puking and that's on you. Hope you have a rag or two in your truck. Rex shot in my direction as a smug grin tugged on his mouth. He stood behind his tiny son, Ryland, who was facing out, both of the one-year-old boy's hands and Rex's as Rex helped him balance. The little thing was doing his best to kick a soccer ball with his foot, not moving it more than an inch, but having a grand time doing it. That shit was cute, that was for sure, the kid like a tiny version of his dad. Sometimes it still fucked with my head to see Rex this way. Guy had been one of my closest friends for pretty much all of my life. He'd taken it about as hard as I had after Sydney had disappeared. Angry at the whole damned world because ours had been rocked, none of us able to make sense of something so brutal actually taking place. Shocked. Traumatized. It had taken that sweet little girl being born for his hardened pieces to start chipping away, meeting Rinna stripping the rest to the ground. Disquiet tumbled through me, a rumble in that dark space. Sometimes it was hard to watch, time moving on, people moving on. Sometimes I wished that I could, too. Didn't matter if I wished for it or not, knew I'd forever be a captive of that day. I shoved the thoughts down and snatched up the ball where I dropped it and pointed it in his direction. You wish, man. Puke duty is not a part of my repertoire. Kale who had been kneeling in front of Evan, pushed to standing and threw me a grin as he jumped into the conversation. This from the guy who owns a bar and his sole purpose in life is to get people tanked. I'm pretty sure Olives has played host to a hurl or two. Kale was our opposite, all clean-cut lines and cleaner jaw, his title of pediatrician fitting him to a T. Not a chance, man. Olives is the classiest of establishments. Assholes get trashed and they're out on their asses. Now you want to talk about what goes down on the front sidewalk in the middle of the night? That's an entirely different story. Language, man, Rex said, angling his head to the side. Knew the look on his face. If we'd been fifteen, that would have been delivered with a punch. Sorry, Kale laughed. Leave it to the bachelor not to be able to figure out how to act around kids. He glanced down when Evan reached up and tugged him by the hand to get his attention. Evan's hands flew through the air, quickly signing something I couldn't read. Kale smiled like a damned fool and signed back. My chest tightened like the yank of a belt. Evan's adoption had just gone through. I wasn't sure I'd ever seen the guy happier than that day. Not that he needed the paper. Pretty sure the guy felt that way from moment one. Loved seeing my crew happy. Finding love after all the bullshit that had been tossed our way through the years. Brutal blow after fucking brutal blow. Two of them had always had my back, stood beside me during the toughest time of my life. Both of them had handled it differently. Rex had fallen into that anger and grief right along with me, like he'd wanted to take some of it on, shoulder some of the burden like he might be able to grant me some relief. 
ridden with a dark empathy when I didn't think he really had the first clue what I was going through. Sydney hadn't been his responsibility, hadn't been the one who was supposed to watch after her, keep her safe. Kale had stood up and become the rock and had been the one to eventually encourage me to move on, to find the bright side when my entire life had gone dark. I waved back, moving Evan's direction and leaning down in front of him. I ruffled a hand through his red hair. Hey, little man, I told him, knowing he'd be able to read my lips. Did you see what I brought? He dropped to his knees with that pad he used for communication, scribbled something quick. He turned it for me to see what he'd written excitement streaking across the mass of freckles that dotted his pale face. You brought my truck? I'm saving all my money from my chores so I can buy it when I get my license. I've got twenty dollars. Is that almost enough? I chuckled under my breath when I read what he'd written. You're getting close, buddy. Real close. What do you say for now we play for a bit and then we take it for a drive? His eyes went wide and he mouthed, Really? Really? I told him, touching his chin. Yep, impossible not to fall. I stood and gave the football a small toss into the air. Who's the next Gingham Lakes high wide receiver? Is his name Evan Bryant? His eyes lit up behind his thick-rimmed glasses, and he gave me an emphatic nod of his head. I gave it a soft pitch in his direction, and he fumbled along for the ball. Kale watched him like a goddamned hawk always wary of the kid's heart. Couldn't imagine having to carry that weight, but neither he nor Hope would let their own fears get in the way of the kid living a full life. Just because he was born with a genetic defect that had almost taken his young life, his parents weren't going to hold him back. And man, did the kid live a full life. He was so full of it he shined. He caught the ball against his chest and Frankie went flying his way, arms stretched out like she was soaring. Here, Evan, throw it to me. I want to catch it. Kind of made me sad that her adorable lisp had all but disappeared. Guess time didn't stop spinning, no matter how badly I might want it to. Didn't think it was possible, but Evan's face lit up even more when he looked at Frankie, and he threw it with all his might, sending it soaring. You know, about ten feet in the air. Fucking cute. You've got a visitor, man, three o'clock. Rex warned and I turned in time to find Ryland toddling my way. His arms were thrown up over his head and he was giggling as he tottered over, anticipating that I was going to scoop him up. I did. It sent a tremor rolling through me. Truth was, kids terrified me. Terrified me in a way that wasn't healthy. Didn't mean these three hadn't melted through the hard places at the center of me, worked their way in, my care fierce, would do absolutely everything in my power to keep them safe. Ryland yanked at my beard with his chubby fingers, his grin so wide as he flashed me a row of four teeth on the top and two on the bottom. He grunted hard like he was talking to me. Ouch, dude, I chuckled, trying to unwind his death grip. That hurts. Kid laughed like it was the funniest thing in the world. So did his dad. Like I said, his dad's mini-me. I scowled in Rex's direction, and this is funny, why? Uh, how about because you're holding my one-year-old like a backpack that might contain a bomb? It was just then I was realizing I had him under the arms, holding him out and away from me. My beard was just out of reach of his flailing arms. Self-preservation, man. Kid's about to tear me limb from limb. Such a pussy, Rex mouthed, smirk on his face as he came to collect his kid. Such an asshole, I mouthed back. Evan was all of a sudden in my line of sight, his hand going over his mouth like he was trying to shield himself from my corruption. Awesome. Turns out Kale was totally right. I had no idea how to act around kids. Such a bad influence. You're hopeless. Kale taunted from behind, picking up the football and hurling it in my direction. Just like the old days. I ran back, caught it with an oomph, and sent it sailing right back. Not sure what you expect. Don't run into a lot of kids in my line of work. Sorry I'm not a kiddie doc who always knows the right thing to say. Catching it, he lifted his arms out to the side. Has nothing to do with my profession. It's just the natural charm. I shook my head with a laugh. Charm? More like constant flow of BS. 
People just pretend like they tolerate you. Which is why you show up to the park to hang out with me. Kale threw the football to Rex. Pretty pathetic if you ask me, Rex said, giving me shit just like the fucker always did. Without a whole lot of effort, he reached out and caught the spiraling ball. The look I shot him would have seared a lesser man in two. Says the guy who said he would come drag my ass here if I didn't show. Now tell me who the pathetic one is. Just felt sorry for you suckers, that's all. Rex grinned as he stepped back to hurl the ball. You're just jealous our lives are filled with parks and diaper bags and spit-up rags. Super glamorous, right? Jealous? I tossed out, spinning on my heel to run because Rex had an arm. That was for damn sure. The ball flew high and far. Finally got out in front of it, and I caught it in both hands. Totally jealous, Kale piped in. Dude doesn't have it in him to admit we have it right, and he's the one missing out. Right for you, man. Right for you. Truth was, I knew they had it right. Saw it on their faces. They were living for the good in life. But that was the kind of good there was no chance I could stomach, because I couldn't be trusted with the good things in life. It's your fault. I trusted you. You were supposed to take care of her. You promised you'd take care of her. An echo of those words assaulted me, and I could almost feel the fists beating against my chest as my mother screamed in agony, her anguish its own phantom that would haunt me the rest of my life. I threw the ball with everything I had, like it might take the sorrow with it, peel it from my skin, or maybe take me back to that time where I could change it, make it right. Kale grunted when he caught the blistering spiral. His eyes narrowed in awareness. The guy knew me well enough to latch on to exactly where my mind had gone. Seriously, Ollie, joking aside, you belong here, man, with our kids, our families. Don't ever question that. That was what they'd become. Didn't mean I didn't continually feel like an outsider. The leech who had nothing but was desperate for something. Latching on, the whole time praying I didn't bleed them dry. My voice went hoarse. Love them like my family. I forced out, my gaze moving to the kids who were playing so free. That's because they are your family. Think we all know well enough blood isn't necessary to make that bond. Rex's words were low. Emphatic. Like he needed me to know. Like he was reminding me of the way it had been when we were kids. And truthfully, the way we were then, could trust both of them with anything. Rex began moving my way, angling his head at Kale to follow. We met in the middle, moving away from the kids a bit, clearly moving out of earshot. So what's this bullshit about Nikki's place getting broken into? Any idea who it might have been? My head shook, unease tying up my guts. No, she's being tight-lipped about it. Stubborn, Kale said, almost offering a smile. I huffed out a frustrated sound. Tell me about it. Pretty sure it has something to do with that meeting she's helping to run. She goes quiet the second I bring it up. Thinks she's protecting someone. A fresh round of fury pulsed through my veins. The acute need to protect Nikki. The urge to hunt. Problem was, I wasn't sure what I'd do if I found the fucker who thought it'd be a good idea to mess with her. I called Seth this morning and he said they still don't have any leads. Couldn't stand the thought that he was still out there. I don't like this whole situation. Something just doesn't sit right. That feeling continued to grow, coming on stronger, an itchy awareness of an approaching storm, something wicked wound with the wind. She's still staying at your place? Kale asked. Yeah. As much as it was driving me straight out of my mind, I wasn't letting her go anywhere. Rex dipped his head quickly, happy with that answer. Rinna is seriously messed up over it. Keeps bringing it up every night, worried about Nikki and what she's going to do. You know Nikki. She tried to play it off like it wasn't a big deal, but Rinna didn't buy it. She suggested we find a house to flip and have Nikki rent it so she's in a safer neighborhood. In contemplation, he looked away before bringing his attention back to me. There was a building that went up for sale by the river. One of the deserted warehouses down on Row. Kale whistled. Took a drive down that dirt road a few weeks back after we had a picnic at the lake. It's like a fucking ghost town out there. Rex nodded. Yup. Place is just about as dilapidated as they come. 
Junkies using it as a drug house and God knows what else. But the location is mint. And you know Broderick, he's always thinking big. He wants in. Luxury condos right on the river. He's envisioning developing the area into a destination spot with stores and restaurants and maybe another hotel in the future. Think I'm going to keep a couple units for investment. Make it affordable for Nikki. She can stay there as long as she wants until she decides on a permanent place. With me. The thought struck me from out of nowhere. Fuck. No, not from out of nowhere. I knew exactly which direction it hit me from. Where it lived. In that deep, deep space that would always fucking belong to that girl. That piece of me she would always hold in the palm of her hand. The only girl I'd ever loved. The one I wanted but couldn't keep. Throat lined with razors, I swallowed hard. Sounds like a solid plan. Thought so too. Stand to make a lot of money, so it isn't going to hurt us a bit to keep one of the units for Nick, even though I know she's going to be all up in arms about it. We're going to have to ease her into the idea. I agree. He eyed me. Not sure what she's going to do in the meantime. It's going to take us at least a year to get the first condos ready, but I don't like the idea of her staying at that apartment. I rubbed my hand over my mouth, my small laugh incredulous. Think it's safe to say that makes two of us. I sucked in a breath. She's just going to have to stay with me until then. Kale's brows shot to the sky. And you think Nikki is going to go for that? Hell no, I said. I'll just have to convince her. Kale grinned. Really? Yup. Rex laughed low, rubbing a hand on his chin. That sounds like... Torture? Torment? I'd be ruined by then, didn't matter. Fun. Rex finished with a smirk. I wanted to smack the smirk off his face. Fun? What? He was all wide-eyed innocence. Nikki is all kinds of fun. Asshole. I punched at him. Laughing, he jumped back, blocking himself. Hey, don't get mad at me because she's... Fun? Kale chuckled. Oh yeah, I bet she's all kinds of fun. Now you get to have fun with Nikki for a whole year. She's a pain in my ass is what she is. Right, Rex drew out. You just keep telling yourself that. But if you do, make sure you don't break her heart while you do it. Suddenly agitated, I scraped a hand through my beard. Not gonna break her heart. Not again. Rex sobered. That girl's been in love with you for as long as I can remember. Followed you around like a puppy all through school. You've got to be careful with that man. Wondered if he really had no clue that it had been more than Nikki following me around. That it had grown into something it shouldn't have before it became responsible for the single greatest regret of my life. How even after I'd shut it down, cut her loose, it had still festered and grown until it had consumed me. And I'd found myself a pathetic beggar at her door. Unable to stop myself from going to her. Needing her knowing I was just going to hurt her all over in the end. Just get that building done. I'll take care of Nikki until it's finished. Barely see her anyway, since we have opposite schedules. All right, then. It's a plan. I nodded. It was a plan. A plan that left me completely screwed and somehow satisfied. Needing a distraction, I pulled away from the guys and shifted to holler toward the kids. Who wants to get ice cream with Uncle Ollie? Frankie Lee tapped Evan's shoulder, the little girl signing to her best friend. In a second flat, both of them were beelining toward me. Me, me, me! Frankie shouted as she and Evan raced my direction. I want to ride with you too! Rex laughed under his breath and scratched at the scruff on his chin. Apparently I'm going to need to have a talk with Frankie Lee about ditching her little brother. Literally left my little man in the dust. I chuckled under my breath. Don't give her too hard of a time. She knows you never take your eye off him. Frankie grabbed me by a hand, and Evan slipped his hand into the other, both of them grinning up at me like I was maybe the coolest person in the world. I gulped down any unease and tightened my hold on their hands, leading them over to my truck parked on the curb. I unlocked the passenger door and both of them clambered onto the seat. Evan first considering the truck was so his thing. He was running his palms over the leather dash, the steering wheel, checking out every detail. I shut the door behind them and rounded the front, climbed inside, turning my face toward him so he could see. 
Still your favorite, buddy? He gave me a thumbs up and a smile that was nothing but bright, shiny teeth. I ruffled a hand through his hair. You have good taste, that I can tell you. He nodded like crazy as he buckled in before he was grabbing Frankie's hand and weaving his fingers through hers. I chuckled under my breath. Oh, so that was how it was. Little player. He didn't even blush when he realized I'd caught him, my eyebrows lifting in question. He just gave me a look that told me she was his to watch over. She missed the whole exchange, too busy vigorously rolling down the window. Start her up, Uncle Ollie, she shouted, and I did, the two of them laughing as I quickly flipped a U and headed in the direction of the ice cream parlor that wasn't even up the road a block. Kale and Rex would walk, but I'd promised Evan a ride and he was going to get his ride. I glanced over at the two of them sitting on the bench seat. So fucking cute. So sweet. So perfect. Frankie Lee's hair blown by the whipping wind, her little hand out the window, gliding up and down like she was riding a wave. Evan's attention was wrapped up in the truck, the dials and gauges and the gear stick I shifted that climbed from the floor and basically stuck up right between his knobby knees. Their hands? Still linked together. I needed to downshift to pull to the curb in front of the parlor, so I grabbed his free hand and wrapped it around the knob, guiding him through the motion. He made this thrilled, scuffing sound that twisted my spirit like it had been rung up by a tornado. Seemed it was the simplest of things that made this kid insanely happy, and damn it, if that didn't make me happy too. I let him help me take it out of gear and put on the brake as we parallel parked on the street, and I told them to wait as I jumped out and headed around to the passenger side that butted the sidewalk. By the time I was helping them out, Rex and Kale were already approaching, little Ryland taking a ride on his daddy's shoulders. You finally made it, I tossed out Riley. Whatever, I can walk faster than that old truck, Rex badgered. Frankie hopped out and bounced over to him. That was so much fun, Rex shook his head. Why doesn't she go on about my truck? Frankie Lee's mouth twisted with distaste. Daddy, your truck is a work truck and stinky and dirty. Look how pretty Uncle Ollie's is. She waved her hand out like she was one of those The Price is Right models. Rex latched onto that real quick. Ah, it is pretty, isn't it? Just like Uncle Ollie. Pretty boy, he taunted. If his kid hadn't been standing there nodding and agreeing like it was the truest thing he'd ever said, I would have given him a finger. Pretty boy, my ass. Come on, you two. I stretched out my hands for Evan and Frankie. I promised you ice cream. Let's get you some ice cream. Yay! Frankie yelled, skipping along at my side. Evan and Frankie went right for the display, pushing up onto their toes so they could see the different flavors displayed behind the glass. They ordered sundaes, and Rex ordered a cone for Ryland. We found a place in the corner where the kids dug right in. Conversation easy. Rex, Kale, and I chatted, catching up since we didn't get to chill like this nearly enough anymore. I froze when I felt the hairs at the base of my neck lift, a prickle of awareness, not in fear. Or hell, maybe that was exactly what it was. Fear. Because the weight of her presence was beginning to become terrifying, affecting me more and more. I slowly shifted in the hard booth so I could glance over my shoulder, wondering if my mind was just making shit up. But no. She was there. Nikki. Honeyed locks cascading down her back in a wild, erratic stream, not curly in the least, but still all over the place. Her back was to me but she was sitting at a table sharing ice cream with this young girl who couldn't be more than 17 or 18. At the girl's side, covered in chocolate ice cream, was a little boy who probably wasn't much older than Ryland, shoveling the ice cream in like he'd just discovered the Holy Grail. By the look on his face, he had. That wasn't what had my insides curling with a crazy sort of worry. Wasn't what had disquiet sinking slow and sure into that vat at the bowels of my spirit where all the bad shit lived compounding and sharpening. It was the way the girl's expression held nothing but beaten down fear, debased and degraded and disparaged, like she couldn't take a single thing more or she would crack. Nikki held her hand in the middle of the table, her head dropped low and tipped to the side. Even though she was facing away from me, I could tell just by her posture that she was speaking to her. 
her words low but fast. Desperate encouragement. Awareness seeped through me like a parched desert sucking up a summer rain. The realization that whatever was going on with Nikki had everything to do with this girl. With that little kid. Like my spirit just got that Nikki was desperate to stand up and protect both of them the way I would protect her. Fully. Wholly. Without question or fear or any consideration to the consequence. Because that's what it came down to. I wanted to protect Nikki, keep her safe, not because I wanted a second chance at saving someone, but because it was the only thing I had left to offer. An eye and an ear and a ruthless heart that wouldn't think twice about striking down anyone who thought to fuck with her. And whatever was happening at that table, that unease climbed my spirit, clawed and expanded. Fury flamed, licks of agitation, stirs of anxiety. Uncle Ollie, Uncle Ollie! Frankie tugged at my shirt. Isn't that right? Damn it, I didn't have a clue what she'd even said. That's right, sweetheart, I mumbled under my breath. Rex cocked a brow, gave me a look that said, Really? Who knew what I'd agreed to? Probably had told her the world was made of cotton candy. For her, I'd give anything to make that statement true. Sunshine and rainbows and everything sweet. I rocked in the hard booth, rubbed my fingertips over my lips, trying to sit still. Nope. Couldn't do it. Give me a minute, I told the guys. No one really even responded when I pushed out of the booth and stalked across the small parlor. Coming to a stop at the edge of their table, I glowered, hands in fists as I stared at Nikki, who still clutched the girl's hand as she frantically whispered something to her. My guts that were screaming cried out. Nikki, what are you doing? What exactly have you gotten yourself into? Reckless girl. Because the girl across from her, who was little more than a child, all out shook when she jerked her attention my way and saw me standing there. Fear. So much fear. I recognized it, written all over her. When Nikki followed the girl's attention and her eyes landed on me, it was horror I saw all over that perfect face. Ollie, she whispered through her shock. Those indigo eyes went round, and her teeth clamped down on her lower lip. Behind her, the sun streaked through the window, glowing around her head, circling her like one of those rainbows I'd just been talking about. Motherfucking sunshine. Nikki, I said, voice so hard it basically had to be pried off my tongue. Energy lashed, something alive and painful between us. Give me a minute, she asked me, repeating the exact thing I'd just told my crew both of us asking for time, but time was something we'd never had. None of it, too much of it, forever lost. I glanced at the girl and the little boy, who was still shoveling ice cream into his mouth, and scrubbed a hand over my face. Yeah, of course. I stepped back, but I refused to walk away. Chapter 13 Nikki. I remained locked in a stare with Ollie, my hand still clutching Brenna's while I begged him with my eyes to give us space. Questions billowed from him as if they were written in the rough, choppy air, concern and this knowing kind of anger that twisted my belly with a rush of anxiety. My worry wasn't for him or what he would think. It was fully for Brenna, the girl who was so completely terrified she was shaking and cowering in her seat as she wrapped a protective arm around her son's waist. Ollie towered there, appearing hard and intimidating, menacing, a beast ready to charge. What she didn't know was that, even though the man didn't know her, he would go down in a blaze to protect her. He'd never lift a vicious hand toward her, not ever, or me. It was his gentle hand that put me in danger. Reluctantly, Ollie backed away. For a beat, my gaze followed him, my heart leaping into my throat when I spotted who he was there with, with those precious kids. This was the problem of living in a small city. Their idea of a fun outing for kids was basically mine too, thinking this would be a great place to keep Kyle entertained while I talked with Brenna. I swiveled my attention back to her. I'm sorry about that. Her eyes warily followed the hulking man as he moved back through the little ice cream shop. Who was that? Her voice trembled. One of my oldest friends. I grew up with him. I gave her hand a squeeze. He's a good guy. 
A great guy, actually. You don't need to be nervous. Funny how it was too easy to sing all these praises because they were true. The man just came with all kinds of other warnings. I'm sorry, she whispered, disgrace clouding her expression. She fiddled with a napkin on the table, looking away when she said, God, I'm such a mess. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I reacted that way. I think I'm losing my mind. You aren't. It was the vile asshole trying to make her think she was insane, filling her head with lies, making her believe she was responsible for the way he treated her. She'd called me this morning, telling me Caleb had been bothering her again, sending her texts, demanding to see Kyle. I'd suggested we meet. I just needed to see her face to face, needing the validation that she was really okay. I was sure Caleb was unstable. I hadn't told her the information I'd shared with Seth, my suspicion that it was Caleb who'd broken into my apartment and had left the two notes. He'd advised I not, that I allow him to investigate a bit so we could find some proof to pin him to. And he'd told me to stay close to Ollie. That was probably the hardest part of what he'd asked me to do. I promise you're not, I told her. You have absolutely nothing to be sorry about, nothing to be ashamed about. Heck, I'm pretty sure grown men cower when they see Ollie coming their way. I let the lightness weave into my tone, hoping it would allow her to relax. He's big. Light laughter filtered free. Yeah, the man is a bear, a big old teddy bear. So maybe that was a tiny white lie. The man would tear someone to pieces with his teeth, but that side of him was not something she needed to worry about. Is he... I heard the suggestion in her question, the pink that touched her cheeks. Is he yours? I was sure there was no way she hadn't sensed that intensity that blazed and burned between us, heavy and fierce, combustible. Ours was not a pretty sort of chemistry. I forced a smile. No, we're just friends. She frowned as if she didn't believe me. Doesn't seem that way to me, Miss Nikki. Was that a tease? Her attention darted to the man I could still feel from behind me as if he was offering up proof. His presence overwhelming. A rush of heat thrashing at my back. No doubt he was looking this way. I cleared my throat. We've just known each other a long, long time, that's all. I should probably head back to my mama's. She grabbed a wipe from the baby bag and began to wipe up Kyle's face and hands. No, Mommy, I eat ice cream. He grinned a chocolate smile. A soft jolt of affection escaped me. Was it yummy? I asked him. Yummy, yummy to my tummy. Do you have a happy tummy? Uh-huh. Good, then my job is done here. You just invited me over to fill my boy with sugar, huh? Seems to me like maybe you should have to watch him run wild for the rest of the day. I loved it when this side of Brenna came out. When she didn't shrink behind her walls, and the girl who wanted to be free peeked out from behind. I'll gladly watch him, any time. She sobered. Thank you so much, Nikki, for everything. Standing, she picked up Kyle and settled him on her hip. I slid out of the booth. For being here for Kyle and me she mumbled as I stood with her. You're welcome. I tickled Kyle's neck, and he giggled, burying his face in the fall of her hair while still peeking out. Affection swelled in my chest. The little thing was so adorable, so sweet and innocent that it expanded that place inside of me that somehow kept feeling more and more hollow. I wanted to take him into my arms, feel his weight, breathe him in. God... What was wrong with me? See you soon, sweet thing, I said, trying to keep my craziness in check. He wrapped his little arms around his mom's neck and grinned. I shifted my attention to Brenna before leaning closer to her, my words a hushed whisper. Remember, you are strong. You have control of your life. You have control of your body. You have the right her head bobbed along, her lips barely moving as she repeated the support group's mantra. I moved in and hugged her tight, my mouth at her ear. Believe it.
Stepping back, she swiped a tear from her cheek. I do. Thank you. For a beat, she looked over my shoulder at the people I could feel staring at me, giving me space while invading it all at the same time. I could hear Frankie Lee jabbering the way she loved to do, and Rex and Kale added little things in, but it was Ollie's silence that was most notable. I'll see you Tuesday night? It was an affirmation and encouragement all in one. She had to make the commitment, even if Caleb was making it hard for her. I will. I promise. Okay, then. I'll see you Tuesday, but if you need anything in the meantime, you know to call me. Don't hesitate. I won't. A desperate sort of a plea wound its way into my tone. Please, be careful. She blinked at me as if she were searching for the things I couldn't say. I will. I promise. For a moment, we both stared at each other before I gave her an encouraging nod toward the door. I'll see you soon. With a timid smile, she turned and made her way through the shop and out into the summer heat. I just stood there, hoping beyond hope that she would stay strong as she ducked her head and headed down the sidewalk. The whole time, I was contending with the shivers racing across my flesh. The awareness that slipped and sped. I ran my hands up my arms, trying to chase the overwhelming feeling away. Pinning on a smile, I shifted around and headed in the direction of my friends. Ollie had remained standing, leaning against the wall with his arms crossed over his massive chest, watching me as if I'd committed some sort of mortal sin. I did my best to ignore it, the tumble of nerves that worked through my body just at the sight of him standing there. So wickedly gorgeous. Jeans and a fitted tee. The man a wall of muscle. I turned toward the table. What are you guys doing here? Frankie Lee squealed, just as she was digging a big spoon into the ridiculous concoction she had in her sundae glass. We're eating ice cream. Is that so? A warm giggle slipped free. Frankie started to ramble, staring up at me while she spooned ice cream into her mouth. I've been missing you, Auntie Nick. Where you been? Working at Pepper's Pies? Did you know my mommy made a brand new kind of pie? Blueberry. I helped. I think I want to name it Blueberry Blast. Will you write it on the chalkboard for me? Of course I will, I told her. First thing Monday morning when I get back to work. She grinned. Did you know my daddy's going to build you a big, big house? Do you think it's going to be bigger than ours? Because my new house is so big, so high. But it's not a skyscraper. Nope. It's just two stories, but I have two stairs, one in the kitchen and one in the living room. My mama used to live there with Grandma Corinne. Did you know that? Frankie rambled on as if what she'd just let on was no big thing, as if she didn't have my entire being jarring back from the shock. My attention whipped to Rex. A guilty expression rode on his too handsome face. Excuse me, but what did your daughter just say? Frankie sighed and lifted her voice. I said, my daddy is going to build you a new house. A frown pulled across my brow when I tipped in Rex's direction. That's what I thought she said. Rex scrubbed a hand over his face. Not like that. Was going to talk to you about it once I had some more details. My frown lifted. More details? Sounds like there were plenty of details to me. Kale laughed. Don't get those knickers all up in a twist, Nick Nick. Haven't you ever heard not to look a gift horse in the mouth? You mean punch a gift horse in the mouth? He busted up laughing. Feisty. Not feisty. Angry. They didn't get to go making decisions for me. I should have known Renan was going to say something to him. I knew she meant well, but that didn't mean it didn't make me feel as if they all thought I was helpless. I turned back to Rex. We're going to talk about this. I figured we would. Nothing to talk about. The husky voice hit me from behind. Shivers raced, and I bit back the irritation that wanted to fly from my tongue. The rest of my friends were just worried about me, even if they were sticking their noses in my business where it didn't belong. But Ollie. I knew Ollie would be a whole different issue.
I tucked the conversation away for later and pasted on a grin, doing my best to change the subject, the direction of their thoughts so I could figure out a way to get out of there with the least bit of attention aimed at me. So what's with all the hotties at the ice cream shop with their kids? Breaking a million hearts just by being here. You guys are nothing but a danger to society. Kale laughed. Danger to society? Um, yes. I gestured with my chin across the shop to the three women sitting together with their kids. The only thing left of those poor women over there is a puddle of drool and a mess of wet panties. It's a sad, sad state of affairs. Panties? Frankie's nose was all scrunched up in confusion. She was getting way too clever for her own good. I was going to have to watch that. Oh, I was just joking, I told her. Your daddy and your uncles are just so good-looking they break hearts without having to say a single word. Good thing your daddy only has eyes for your mommy. Evan grabbed the notepad sitting in front of his dad and scribbled across it. My chest squeezed. Painful, perfect affection. My daddy doesn't break hearts. He fixes them. This kid. Of course your daddy fixes hearts, I told him, wishing I could sign it because it meant so much. Evan's heart now beating strong because Kale had saved him almost two years ago. I could never quite imagine what kind of bond that might forge. Unshakable. At least that I knew. Because your daddy is the best. A rumble of something echoed from Kale's chest. All right, all right, no need to get carried away. We already know I'm awesome. Ish, I told him. Couldn't let it all go to his head. He winked at me. I took a step away, ready to bolt, to get away from the energy that crawled over me from behind. Well, it was so nice to see you all. Hopefully we can get together soon. I've been missing my little pumpkins. I need some Audie Nick time. Yeah. Chills flashed with the single word, with the rough caress of Ollie's voice. I was just heading out, too. I'll follow you back to my place. I walked, shot from my mouth. If Caleb was keeping tabs on my car, the last thing I wanted was it sitting out in front for him to see when I was inside with Brenna. Then I'll give you a lift. My head whipped that way. I don't think that's necessary. He stuffed his big hands in his pockets. Well, I think it is. I could argue with him right there in front of everyone. What good would it do? It would just prolong the inevitable. But at least that would have bought me some time to figure out what to say. I said my goodbyes, and Ollie said his. Frankie jumped into his arms and gave him a big hug, peppering his bearded face with little girl kisses that he didn't seem to know how to take, yet reveled in at the same time. The man a twisted dichotomy. Ollie headed toward the door, and I followed. Chained to him in some profound, inexplicable way. Because, honestly, I owed him no explanation. But there I was, following right behind him as if I didn't have a choice, bound by these zaps of awareness. Electricity tapped, both of us feeding off the other until it became so big we were consumed by it. We ducked out into the blazing heat. Instantly, we were washed in the overpowering scent of honeysuckle and blazing stars, the air so thick it was almost sweet as it slicked our skin in humidity. The burly, overbearing man strode for his truck, which was parked at the curb. He opened the passenger door and held it open for me. Thank you, I muttered. Ollie only answered with a tight dip of his head. His entire demeanor was rigid as he climbed into the driver's side and started the old rambling engine. I swore that old truck only shook us up more as we traveled the short distance back to his building. My lungs squeezed almost painfully when I attempted to draw in a breath. Everything sharp and too tight. He pressed the button to open the sliding door that led to his garage. Slowly, we entered into its darkened depths. The garage door dropped behind us, and it felt as if it closed off the rest of the world. We disappeared into it. Into a place that was only Ollie and me. Anger and attraction and regret. God... It was so hard sitting at his side and feeling like that was exactly where I was supposed to be and knowing those thoughts were nothing but foolish. I couldn't allow him to affect me like this. He parked in the mess of all his metal, 
his collection of cars and motorcycles just as powerfully beautiful as the man. He came around and helped me down. I said nothing, just headed for the old warehouse elevator that had been restored with the rest of the place. I felt as if I was stepping into a cage as Ollie slid the restored metal gate closed. Prisoned. Oh, God. His brutal energy hammered through the confined space, radiating from the walls, slamming back into me. Fed by the flashes of light that blipped through the bars as the elevator clanged and churned and rose. The elevator jerked as it came to a jolting stop at the top floor and I stumbled. Ollie's hand darted out to steady me, burning on my hip. Fire flashed. I sucked in a breath, pinned by that sapphire gaze. His exhale was close to pain as he opened the gate where it dropped us right at his door. We moved out into the enclosed hall, and he unlocked the door to his loft, stepping in behind me. Sunlight streaked through the big windows and poured into the rambling space, stretching for all the darkened, shadowy corners. Anxiety clawed across my chest. I wasn't ready to answer his questions about Brenna, even though I could feel the weight of them from the harsh pants he exhaled through his nose. Dropping my head, I started for the hallway that led to the bedrooms, needing to escape. You gonna tell me who you were sitting with? His voice came from right behind me. Heated chills streaked across my skin, as hot as the sun. A friend, I told him. A friend? It was all a challenge, and I whirled on him, ready to put him in his place. Because I didn't owe him a damned thing, and he sure as heck didn't have any right to question every single person I spoke to. Ollie was right there, dipping to get in my face. I swallowed around his blistering potency. That girl was terrified of me, Nikki. And I'm pretty sure I know your friends, considering all your friends are mine. I don't owe you an explanation. Bullshit, he spat. The force of the word pinned my back against the wall. He only backed me further into it by taking another step forward. Towering over me, his teeth ground as he issued the words of breath from my lips. Tell me what the fuck is going on. I know whoever that girl was is linked to what happened at your apartment. I tipped my head up so I could meet his stare. Black sapphire, hard as steel. I already told you there are some things you can't know, Ollie. He tugged at his hair agitation thick, eyes pinching before he loosed an uncontained growl as he flew around as if he couldn't stop himself. A punch landed against the opposite wall. I shrieked and flinched. Fear tumbled down my spine. Not for my physical safety, just for the sheer ferocity of the man. Ollie unhinged, losing it, hanging on by a thread. He roared and whirled back around before his words dropped so low they seeped from between clenched teeth. I know you're hiding something from me. I know it because I know you. He slammed that same fist into his chest right over his heart. And I can't protect you if you don't let me in. I shoved at him, unwilling to allow him to do this. Unwilling to let him look at me as if I was the center of his world. His gravity. The only thing that kept him anchored when he continually kept me adrift. You don't get every part of me, Ollie. Not anymore. Hurt bled with the words. I stormed for the bedroom I'd so stupidly begun to think of as my own. I had to get the hell out of there. I couldn't stay a second longer. Seth had told me to stick close, but I didn't know how to do that, not with Ollie affecting me this way. I had no clue what I was going to do or where I was going to go. All I knew was I had to leave. I banged into the door. The breath jerked from my lungs in another shriek when one of those big hands snatched my wrist and tugged until I was spinning around. Before I could make sense of it, before I could process it, he had me pressed against the dresser that sat against the wall. Both of those big hands had me by the face. A war flashed through his expression, a battle that raged. It only lasted a second before his mouth crashed against mine, crushing, devouring, overpowering. And oh God, did it ever feel good. I whimpered, and my lips parted. He took it as an invitation. Or maybe he was just breaking in. His hot tongue slid against mine, and a ball of want so huge I could barely breathe around it built in my center, 
desire, and need. Old, old love. If only it wasn't encased in a shell of bitterness, gelled by bitter, broken hurt. My hands flew to his wide, wide shoulders and my fingernails sank in. I didn't know if I was holding on or pushing him away. A needy moan escaped my throat, and I clung to him in a way I knew I shouldn't, in a way I couldn't. Yet there I was, wanting to crawl right inside him, wanting to stay there forever, where everything felt perfectly right and there weren't a million things wrong around us. I felt so small against him, every massive inch of his body covering mine, eclipsing everything. He kissed me as if he'd gone mad. The man finally undone, lost, but searching for a way to break out of the labyrinth that held him hostage. Those big hands spread across my shoulders and rode down my sides until he was palming my bottom and tugging me against his hips. It elicited a pant, and my heart thundered in my chest, as frantic as his. I felt the world tremble around me when he rubbed himself between my thighs, his cock so big and hard where it pressed against his jeans, as daunting as the man. Heat spiraled, a vortex of dark greed, a need I couldn't afford to feel, but it was there. I sucked in a desperate breath of desire. Ollie struggled to get me closer. He rocked and rocked, creating this friction I could feel sparking between us. A match and gasoline. Nikki, sweet girl. God, why do you feel so good? So fucking good. I could feel his torment slide out with every word, with every wayward thrust of his hips. I meant to push him away, but my fingers moved to the longer pieces of hair at the top of his head. I fisted two handfuls of it and held on while he consumed my mouth and my knees buckled out from under me. Hiking me up, he wrapped my legs around his waist, holding me while his lips danced in a delicious push and pull tongue exploring, teeth nipping and tugging, delirium. I ripped my mouth from his and prayed it would afford me some good sense, gasping for air as I panted toward the ceiling. It only made things worse. Ollie kissed along my chin and across the exposed skin of my throat. He lapped up and down the sensitive flesh, nipping and biting as he continued to grind himself against my center, which throbbed almost painfully. God, I wanted him. I wanted him so badly, but sometimes it was the things we wanted the most that would destroy us in the end. Nikki, he rumbled again, a guttural groan of pleasure all mixed up with agony. So dark and needy. Ollie. It was a whimper. Hope and love and everything I'd ever wanted. He palmed my breast, and he brushed his thumb over my nipple that pebbled with his touch. I ached. I glowed. I pressed deeper into his hold and he practically growled. These tits. Fuck, Nikki, you drive me out of my mind. What the fuck am I doing? What the fuck am I doing? Every fear I had came out with his own reservations that he rumbled across the skin of my neck, sliding over me like a slow warning. Because I knew better. I knew better. I knew this was only going to end with my heart splattered all over the floor, and no one would be there to pick up the pieces because he was the one who'd made the mess in the first place. Even though it was weak, I nudged at his shoulders. Ollie, I cried, softly. A prayer for him to stop doing this to me, pushing and pulling, taunting and ruining. Nick, he grated, moving back to my mouth. His lips were so plush and soft and smooth, the perfect contrast to the scruff of his beard that scratched at my chin. The promise of so much pleasure. Every rush of his hand across my body was fueled by rage, softened by affection. God, this man would be my complete undoing, my beautiful beast. He worked his mouth against mine, coaxing and demanding. His presence filled me, heart and spirit and lungs. Toasted vanilla, barrels of oak soaked in liquor. Just his presence was enough to get me drunk, his touch enough to desolate. But this kind of pleasure would only bring pain, and I was so not into that sort of thing. I pushed again and squeezed my eyes shut when I whispered, Stop. 
It was so low I wasn't sure he could even hear it, but I knew he felt it. A harsh exhale ripped from his lungs as he set me on my shaky feet. His chest heaved as he reached out and gripped the top of the dresser behind me, locking me in while he pressed his body away. An earthquake shook, the man a rigid fortress that towered and loomed. Beneath him, my entire being trembled, the quiver starting somewhere in my spirit and rattling out. Uncontrollable, both of us shaking and shaking, trying to catch up with what we'd just let happen. Another mistake tossed in that mounting pile. I swallowed around the love and need and the hurt. You don't get to do this to me, Ollie. Not again. I refuse to let you do this to me. I could feel the erratic boom of his heart, contending with rage and all the things he wouldn't allow me to see. Fuck. I'm sorry. I'm so goddamn sorry. He eased back a fraction and shocked me again when he shackled me by the wrists. My hands locked between us. He dropped his forehead to mine. You can't leave, Nikki. I know what you were getting ready to do. And I can't let you leave. His voice was grief. A plea. He edged back and those blue eyes tangled with mine. And I can't let you keep taking pieces of me and discarding the rest. Not again, Ollie. My heart can't take it. And God, he just kept turning everything upside down because he reached out and cupped one side of my face. So soft. So sweet. His thumb moved across the moisture I didn't even know had seeped onto my cheeks. You can hate me all you want. I deserve it. I'm a bastard, and I know it. But I can't stand the thought of you out there by yourself. Can't stand not knowing who broke into your place. Can't stand the thought of knowing you're in trouble and not being able to do anything about it. Please, don't leave. I don't know how to stay here with you. Not when things are like this between us. It hurts too much. He flinched before all that rippling muscle tightened, every inch of him hard. I need to take care of you. Tell me what's happening with that girl at the ice cream shop. I started to form the excuse, but he cut me off. No more bullshit. I know you're in trouble. I can't tell you that. It was the truth. I refused to break Brenna's confidence. His voice somehow softened, and his head tipped to the side as he looked at me. What have you gotten yourself into, Nikki? For a beat, I hesitated, and then I gave him a little of my truth. I just want to make the world a better place. Minutely, his head shook. Anger was clear in the clench of his jaw. World is nothing but corruption and evil and greed. Like a fool, I pressed his hand closer to my face, savoring the warmth. For one more moment, I relished in this brute of a man I had no business taking comfort in. But he'd always, always been my safe place. If I can help one person, just one, Ollie, I made that ugly world better for them. I wondered how long it had been since I'd been that honest with him. Pain struck on his features, worry and adoration. The last was always what nearly dropped me to my knees, but there was too much of that corruption piled between us for the last to count. His soul soiled and brittle and hard. There was no longer any place for me. When he looked at me like that, though, it made me want to believe I was wrong. He blew out a resigned breath. I need to keep you safe. I searched his face my voice quiet but strong, because for once, I wanted him to be honest with me too. You want more than that? No. What just happened was a mistake. He might as well have punched me. That was what his denial felt like. How many more of them could I take? A smile wobbled on my face. It was so fake, I thought maybe my face might crack. Then you have to let me go. You know that's impossible. I would kill for you, Nikki. Die for you. Then why wouldn't he live for me? Devastation crawled across my chest like a disease. Oliver Preston, the infection and the cure. He took a lumbering step back. An agitated, tattooed hand roughed through his hair, which was sticking up everywhere from my desperate hands tugging at it. You aren't leaving, Nikki. Someone broke into your place, busted the door 
trashed your stuff. You and I both know it wasn't some stupid kids. My brow pinched in disbelief. What, am I your prisoner now? If that's what it comes to. Tears pricked at my eyes. You're such an asshole. He started for the door, mumbling under his breath. Tell me something I don't know. A second before he stepped out, he paused and shifted to look back at me. The severity of it pinned me to the spot. I'm just asking that you do this one thing for me, Nikki. One thing. All I'm asking is for you to stay. Without saying another word, he turned and strode out of the room, shutting the door when he went. How was that fair, when the one thing I wanted was the one thing he would never give me? Not when the only thing I wanted was for him to stop breaking my heart. <laughs>